Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Science Changing Life with me, Drew Duglin. Today, we have woken up to be discussing the importance of sleep for health and disease and many of the issues surrounding getting a good night's slumber. I'm joined with physician scientist Stuti Jaiswal, who is part of the digital clinical trials team. She's studying how fitness trackers and other wearables can be used in sleep medicine, as well as in our personal lives, to help understand sleep better and inform any future interventions. So let's join Stuti as she describes how the passion for neuroscience and the care for her patients made her the sleep expert she is today. It's hard for me to remember a time where I didn't really have science as a really big interest. And as I got into high school, it got even bigger. When I got to college, I wavered a little bit and I, I thought I might do business and go to like finance and all this. But I think I was even more solidified after taking more and more sort of biochem classes. And I loved neuroscience. I took one neuroscience class and I was just... I was addicted. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, hard to think about if there was a really early turning point for science, but definitely just something that feels like it was ingrained for a long time. Well, that's interesting that you were so uh, interested in biochemistry and neuroscience. So then where did the interest in sleep come in? So it's funny, I took kind of a, almost a circuitous route to get to where I am. i got into neuroscience. I was doing neuroscience lab work. And then I got into sort of the PhD program and I was going that road. Ended up getting into medical school right around the same time. And I ended up doing a really pretty basic science PhD between my second and third year of medical school. And I loved the basic science research. I thought that I would not practice clinically, but I got to my third and fourth year and I loved taking care of patients, like loved taking care of patients. And it was hard to find a spot in medicine that I thought, you know, really fit with neuroscience and, and the things that I like to do clinically and the things that I like to do in the lab. So I ended up becoming an internist and a hospitalist specifically. And Sleep is one of those things that is really, really difficult for patients, and it links really back to core neuroscience principles, and a lot of things that we don't know in neuroscience relate to sleep medicine. So from a patient perspective, both in an ambulatory setting as well as an inpatient setting, sleep has been really important for the patients that I take care of. So that was probably the biggest thing that got me interested in sleep. So a lot of the things that we think about in sleep relate to many aspects of health, some of them still in brain science and others sort of just in health and human body in general. Yeah, I was going to ask you, I mean, sleep just seems like one of these huge uh, pillars of health. So, I mean, can you speak to just how important it is and what some of these issues around sleep are and the connection to you know, overall health and, and sort of um, disease as well? I think sleep is becoming, it's become so important, right? And the more and more that we understand about it, the more and more we realize that it's related to so many different aspects of our health. So that's probably one of the most interesting things about sleep, right? There's so much unknown about it. I would say as a medical student and as a you know medical resident, we don't get a lot of sleep as it is. And I sort of feel like that's where, you know, start, you start to feel the effects of it, right? So you know, as a person, when you're not getting enough sleep, that you are not at your optimal function, right? You feel like, I can't really think clearly. I'm sluggish. You know, maybe I have more aches and pains than normal. Maybe you even feel like metabolically you're not functioning as well. Maybe you think, oh, I'm like putting on weight. I don't know. And what we're finding more and more is that when people do the research, that what we what, what we fear when we lack sleep is probably fairly true. So um, it impacts your heart. It impacts your blood vessels. It impacts even how you think. So there's been new research that suggests inadequate sleep or not sleeping enough may actually increase your risk for dementia down the line. So all this stuff that we sort of feel when we're sleeping, when we're not sleeping well, I think research is really starting to show that, yes, this is really incredibly important for people and for specific health problems now, not just on how you feel. Right. And you just brought up the clinical setting and it's it's sort of depressingly ironic that the people who are supposed to be safeguarding our health, right, are getting some of the worst <laughs> sleep. I mean, is that still the case? Have you seen any um, shifting in the tides there? 
I think so. So actually, um, oddly enough, I work as a nocturnist. So my hospital shifts are primarily at nighttime. I d- rarely do days. So I think I see the worst of both in a way. So the patients who cannot sleep in the hospital, I have patients who are 85 who've never taken a sleep medicine in their life, begging to be placed on one. People who are awake all night, not only because of their own illness, but because of you know, just the hospital environment being incredibly busy, you know, a lot of care being provided even at odd hours. Um, you know, your antibiotics have to be given on a certain schedule, right? So, I mean, you get you get woken up. I mean, your clinical care comes first over your sleep in a way. In terms of errors, I think we have made a difference. And so in terms of patients, you know, we see that. But also, I mean, nurses are exhausted. Physicians are exhausted. You know, you're not thinking as clearly at 3 a.m., no matter how much sleep you tried to get during the daytime. So there is a lot of, you know, concern on shift work, right? So people who work night shifts, not only on their own health, but how are they taking care of patients? I think some of the improvements that we've made in that regard are the length of shifts that we make trainees work. So if you're a medical student or a resident, there are now limits that are placed on the number of hours that you can be in the hospital. So I think that has been an important change. And my understanding is that it has in- improved sort of the errors that that are associated with that. But I think, you know, I tell colleagues who take over care in the morning to always just, you know, double check or make sure that, you know, we've, we've done everything right in the middle of the night. Yeah, so you have to sort of be extra alert, I feel like in a way. I don't know if you know this, but my background is actually uh, circadian rhythm. So it, really, it, it, yeah, <laughs> it's actually been interesting seeing that recognition of sort of what people are calling chronotherapy, right? You know, can mm-hmm. we time medicines perhaps uh, in a better yes. way in the clinic or at least adjust the lighting schedule so people can sleep better so it's interesting to see how the science maybe butts up against some of these like logistical challenges uh, yeah you know. and i think it's also stuff that what's re- you know we really want to try and apply to patient care so i'm also very interested in sort of the inpatient sleep setting but you know can we change things like the you know the light uh, during the daytime the amount of light in nighttime so one of the studies that we did in the hospital was you know, how much light and sound are patients exposed to both during the day and during the nighttime. And, you know, it's just such a low level of lighting in the hospital at nighttime. It's barely probably office lighting. And for your own circadian rhythm, it doesn't keep you on track. And then you end up with other hospital problems like delirium if you're an older adult or just not being able to think as clearly, you know, as a patient and focus on your own care. So circadian rhythm stuff is really, you know, I feel like uh, playing a bigger role in more and more things in the inpatient setting and maybe in the outpatient setting too. For sure. And then, yeah, moving away from the clinic then and sort of the broader public, it strikes me that people really aren't sleeping as much perhaps as they we're used to. So do you feel like that's the case? You know, how much sleep do we tend to get on average as a nation? And do you know why there has perhaps been a, a decrease in sleep, if that's the case? You know, I really feel like there's at least a decrease in perceived sleep. But I think if you look back at, you know, to like the 1960s, I think there's actually been some data that's been published on, you know, are we really losing sleep as, uh, you know, as a society now that we're kind of getting into this you know, I mean, we're working 24 seven, right? I mean, people are working through weekends, people are working late at night, you know, and our, our social lives also sort of take over. And really, I don't think the objective data supports a huge loss of sleep, but I definitely mm-hmm. think people feel they are not sleeping either as well or as much as they were before. And for adults, most sleep societies recommend on the order of seven to nine hours of sleep per night. And I would say about 60 to 65% of the population generally meets that. And that's based on people who report their own sleep and also studies that we've done based on sleep measurements that we've tried to take. But that leaves about 30% of our population that is at risk for short sleep duration. But yeah, I think as a society, I think what's problematic is that we don't feel like we're sleeping well, you know, and, and why is that? So, and that kind of goes to, you know, the your sleep quality, you know, like, how are you, how do you feel like you're sleeping? And that can be different for every different person, right? I mean, we, you and I can maybe get the same amount of sleep each night, but have a different perception on how we feel like we slept. Yeah, got it. That's fascinating. And so in terms of the measurements, then I understand you and the team at the Translational Institute have sort of come up with this novel approach uh, to study sleep. So can you perhaps sort of talk about that broadly and what it is you're looking at? 
Yeah. And so I think um, traditionally when we think about how we measure sleep, I think people might think about a sleep lab, right? So a person sent into a very clinical setting, they're hooked up to multiple different wires and cannulas. They've got, you know, an EKG, they have stuff on their forehead, they have, you know, pipes going into their nose. I mean, it's very, you know, it's, it's elaborate and you can't do that at home, right? So if you get like a sleep measurement, you had to go somewhere else that was a sort of a measured sleep. So most of the stuff in terms of sleep that we know has been self-reported. So it's people saying, oh yeah, I think I sleep this much, or this is how much sleep I got, you know, based on sleep diaries or basically just patient report. Um, but what's been really interesting, I think, since we have integrated accelerometry technology into almost everything that we have, we've been able to get these passive measurements of sleep data. So accelerometry is basically what's built into your Fitbit device or your Apple Watch or even your phone. People are building them to stickers you can put on your forehead. You can have an accelerometer and a mattress. I mean, you were able to really now pick up and detect these activity changes between day and night. And we can get a general sense at least of what people are sleeping uh, in terms of their duration and maybe you know how much they're awakening at night and what time they're in bed and what time they're getting out of bed. So the you know data that we get from activity trackers isn't really it's not polysomnography, right? So it's not the gold standard measurement of sleep, but it gives you a pretty good idea or a pretty general view of how people are sleeping from an objectively measured way. So we're really trying to harness that type of of objective information that is out there in the population already. And we're trying to bring that into the research studies that we do. So, you know, these are really passive measurements. The participant doesn't really have to do a whole lot, right? I mean, they're just wearing an activity tracker. They're probably, they're not putting too much thought into it for the most part in terms of how much did I sleep, right? They're not having to report that. They're just getting a measurement. So we're really trying to harness that data that is out there uh, kind of in really large quantities um, and bring that into the clinical questions that we have regarding sleep and whether there are similar questions to um, what has been previously answered with subjectively reported sleep or, you know, new questions now that even surround, you know, how we think and, or how, um, how our sleep impacts how we think or, you know, cardiology um, related outcomes or even obesity related outcomes. For sure. And in these large scale data studies, then are you looking across sort of the whole population? Are you just looking at healthy people or people with sleep issues already or other uh, health problems? I think it's a good question, right? Because who signs up for a sleep study, right? Is it someone who sleeps just fine or is it people are, are, are they people who have trouble with they, their sleep and they want to know more? So it is a question that we have, but I think some of the data that we're able to get um, is so large scale that it covers a really broad percentage of the population, right? So our goal in that is we'd like to break it down though, in terms of are these people who are having trouble with their sleep? And when we pull them into a study, we're able to survey them on what they feel like is a problem. So some people, people will tell you if they feel like they have a sleep problem or not. So then you can start dividing it out into maybe this is a question we're going to address for people who have insomnia or you know, obesity in this particular group of individuals. So there's a lot of data to be had. So <laughs> anybody who wears a Fitbit or anybody who has like a you know Apple device or whatever it is, any activity tracker, we we, um, we're hoping to capture larger and larger groups of people to be involved in these studies, um, especially trying to attract people and um, trying to get people into the study who um, may be underrepresented, right? Well, a lot of times we have such difficulty capturing what is going on in more uh, underrepresented areas of medicine. So it would be nice to at least get these studies out there onto a really broad degree to include as many people as we can. And you just mentioned these fitness trackers having a sort of broad idea of uh, what someone's sleep is like. And uh, that was actually going to be one of my questions. I mean, do we know how accurate these things are and how do they work? Is it based on activity? Is it heart rate? Is it other things that these trackers can measure? Sure. So I feel like uh, I, I have a Garmin device now and I feel like it tells me things that I never even thought to ask about my own <laughs> And I don't know. Sometimes I, what tells me like what my mood has been. And I just, you know, I don't know how these companies kind of come up with these algorithms. But so the way these devices work, um, it's actually the base technology in all of them is a fairly old technology based on accelerometer. So an accelerometer is basically, um, it takes the movements in either your wrist or your hip, or depending on where you place it, it can put it in many different places, but it does measure activity. So in a certain period of time, say in a 15 second or a 30 second 
period, it measures how much activity was um, recorded in that minute or in that period of time. And then that's sort of tracked over the course of the day. And then it's the these devices are able to have algorithms that can compare when there's a longer period of inactivity compared to when there are larger periods of activity. And it measures it based on multiple regions around the particular time in question. So that is probably the most base level, just based on the activity technology that we use. And that gives us the idea, or at least gives us the sense of the amount of sleep people get. So it gets a sleep duration. And then now we are adding in heart rate to some of these devices. And that more so is trying to get at sleep staging information. So the newer Fitbits and the newer activity trackers, a lot of that when they're including heart rate and heart rate variability in those measurements, they're trying to get at a more complex measurement of sleep. But you don't need very much just to get the you know, general gist of how a person is sleeping throughout the day. And those stages of sleep, is that what we mean by sort of sleep quality then? If you're getting the right sort of cycling between, you know, different stages and does that relate to maybe when you dream versus if you're just in sort of a deeper rest state? Yeah. So, I mean, I think so sleep quality can be a really subjective thing, but part of it can be based on the, you know, the proportion of deep sleep or rapid eye movement sleep that you're getting. So when you're thinking about dream state, you're thinking more so like the rapid eye movement sleep. So yes, those devices are trying to capture those periods. And so I feel like the technology on that is getting better and better, but also is still more so under investigation for applying to more research-based studies or kind of in in sort of that research-grade technology that we use. But I do think some of the quality um, metrics that you might get from the devices that people use are based on that, you know, how much rest did you get in REM? When was that? You know, how long was your deep sleep period? So it it is definitely being used for those quality metrics that I think people get like a sleep scores and things like that on those devices. Do you ever see sort of disparities between what the data might say on your watch versus how you feel? Because you might wake up feeling like, oh, I feel really well rested. <laughs> Look at your tracker and it's like, <laughs> you're all in the red with these scores. Yeah, no, <laughs> totally. <laughs> and I think people sometimes tell me, uh, you know, my, my Fitbit said I only got four hours, but I feel fine. You know? <laughs> and I think that really goes to, you know, how you feel like you slept is totally subjective and different between two people, right? I mean, you could have somebody who, you know, slept eight hours last night and was awake three times. And one person might say like, oh, I only got eight hours. I woke up three times last night and I just could not get back to sleep. And somebody else might be like, oh, I was asleep for eight hours. I only woke up three times. You know, it's the same, could have the same sleep pattern and you feel differently. I will say this, I think having like a fully charged device uh, is actually really important on that measurement. I have had people who I think, uh, you know, when their battery is really low, I do wonder about that sleep measurement. Sometimes I wonder if that's what's going on for for people in there, but I think there's a natural discrepancy between how people feel like they sleep and what what their devices might measure, what we might measure. And both of those are really important, but some of the studies show that the objective measurements are what are linked to more health-related outcomes. So, you know, how you feel you sleep isn't necessarily been shown in some certain studies to link to the health outcome that was studying, but the real measured sleep was what it, um, what related. Oh, man, that's even more depressing. <laughs> like, oh, I don't need to do a sleep study. I, I always sleep great. And then it's like, oh, maybe I'm not. Maybe, yeah, no, I mean, that's important to know. Like, you know, maybe you feel like you run fine on four and five hours of sleep. But, you know, studies will suggest that actually, no, your outcomes are, if you if truly you're sleeping four or five hours, your health outcomes are not. Um, they're linked more so to that short sleep instead of how you feel you sleep. And something else that strikes me with, patterns in sleep is uh, when people get older, perhaps maybe they sleep less or the sleep becomes sort of fragmented with age. So do you know why that is? And is this something you might be measuring too? Yes. So um, how older adults sleep is a really big area of interest for us. And yes, your sleep patterns certainly change over time. Your sleep stages sort of get more consolidated and you need less time to get through all of the cycles of sleep that you need. So people and older adults tend to have sort of a natural predisposition to have less sleep in general. Uh, there's also um, health-related issues and age-related issues can make you wake up more at nighttime. Um, so whether that's pain or you know adults with like prostate issues, or even, um, even like anxiety and depression, all those things sort of, you know, relate to how you sleep. But older adults do um, tend to have more awakenings at nighttime. 
um, which can um, impact how they sleep. There's also been some studies that are kind of interesting that show that impaired sleep early on. So if you are someone who has a lot of sleep impairment, it may actually be an early sign of like a cognitive issue. So like a dementia related issue or Alzheimer's related issue. So there are some, we're not totally sure, sure what comes first, you know, is it the sleep related, is it the sleep problem that comes first that may relate to dementia or is it um, impaired sleep is an early sign of dementia? There's still some you know, back and forth about that and the data. We're still working on some of those questions. Something I'm interested in hearing from you because you said you were a nocturnist is, is the timing of sleep as important as say like overall duration? Because people have sort of um, different habits, right? With, you know, whether they are a early riser and they go to bed early versus if they stay up all night and then sleep in. <sighs> Yeah, yeah. So there, there's a lot of question surrounding that. I feel like I, I don't want to bring down, like, I feel like this is a positive podcast, but, but you know, so I feel like I'm going to bring up all this, like, I feel like I'm going to bring like this doomsday view, but really uh, the time the when you get your sleep is actually really important. So I mean, if you take the um, idea of shift workers, so if you think of, say, for example, nurses that might work night shifts, it's the more night shifts that you work in a month, like your outcomes for cancer, are far worse, like so, including like breast and GI um, cancer. So they did this uh, study for women. It was in the nurse heart health study some time ago, and they tracked how much shift work these participants were getting, how much sleep they felt like they were getting in the day, and the timing of your sleep is important. So that circadian rhythm that matters. So I mean, trying to catch up in the daytime, you don't really get that same type of sleep when your circadian rhythm is totally thrown off. So there's been um, some interesting research, even done at Scripps uh, Research, that's talked about sort of metabolic and cellular level changes that are important based on the timing of when sleep occurs. So there are things that just happen in your body that during the time of day that you need sleep for those cellular activities to function properly. And then when we talk about also, um, so duration, I would say, so if you're kind of just thinking about people who sleep at nighttime and not thinking about people who sleep, like shift work people who sleep during the day, um, and are awake at night. Yeah, um, duration matters probably the most. So just thinking about the general population. So how much sleep you get in a day, whether you get like a nap in the in the morning and seven hours of sleep, the total amount of sleep duration you get matters. What we're also finding is that people who maybe have like less sleep during the weekdays, maybe there are six hour sleepers on the weekday, but maybe like a eight or nine hour sleeper on the weekend, those individuals also have maybe are, are linked to more um, worsened health outcomes. So your sleep variability or how regular your sleep is also matters. Um, maybe not as much as duration matters, but the irregularity does matter. Uh, try and keep a regular schedule. Yes, then. <laughs> definitely. Um, so if, I think the people who, who we think probably do best, and this is still stuff that we're studying and working out for different outcomes, but people who probably do best are the ones who get maybe exactly seven and a half hours every night. So, you know, people who are trying to catch up or get extra sleep on the weekends might actually be doing themselves a disservice. But again, that's assuming that you're having a good sleep duration at minimum on those weekdays. Yeah, I thought the most recent data I had seen was that uh, that rotational shift work seemed to really be really, really bad. Like it wasn't just um, if you're flipped and you um, only sleep in the day. It was like if you're constantly going from day to night, day to night, yes. you can never really adapt. Yes. Yeah. And then you think how many people really are awake in the daytime, though, for 30 days out of the month, or sorry, sleeping during the daytime over 30 days out of the month, right? People who do shift work, I mean, for the most part, they do have that up and down. But yes, that has definitely also been shown to be problematic. So because I think it's just so few people who are, you know, truly fully nocturnal, <laughs> where, you know, they spend 365 days out of the year sleeping, um, sleeping during the daytime, which I, I'm sure at that point, maybe your circadian rhythm would shift. But uh, most people, I mean, we live on a social schedule, right? I mean, children, yeah. family, work, you know, I mean, the activities that happen in the day, I mean, our, our life sort of forces us to be awake in the daytime for, for many different reasons. So I guess that bottom line then with uh, the shift work that you just mentioned was, you know, just try and get as much sleep as you can if it's not uh, optimal timing. Yeah, I think yeah. you do the best that you can, right? I think overall, um, those shift work is probably one of the things that we're going to have to work on or think about um, ways to reduce for people overall. And again, it's sort of dose dependent, right? So the more that you do or the more transitions that you have, we think it's probably worse for you. So then do you use a wearable device to track your sleep? 
And uh, if so, you know, what have you noticed and has it changed any of your habits? I've gone through many different devices. <laughs> so, um, yes. And I think part of it is uh, my interest in sleep. Uh, so I'm not someone who I think uh, sleeps poorly. So I, I didn't wear it for that reason. Um, but I, I wear mine at nighttime because of, for these reasons to check accuracy of devices and to kind of see what I like. And it does, it did actually change my habits quite a bit because it would tell me how much I was sleeping. And I found I was, I thought I was getting a full eight hours of sleep, if not more. And my device was telling me, pretty much every night I was getting, you know, five and a half to six and a half. And so I did really try and make sure I was in bed on time and, you know, not waking up early. So it did actually change my habits, which I think, you know, if you, if you're hyper-focused on it, that's not a great thing, but if you can get an idea of your own, your own sleep, I think it is those, they are beneficial in helping maybe make some habit changes. Um, and some people are surprised to find um, the number of hours they sleep. You know, people tell me like, I didn't, do you really think it's possible that I'm awake this many times a night. And yeah, I mean, the truth is you might actually be having these, you know, small awakenings from sleep that you're not even aware of. So I think people do learn quite a bit about themselves um, from that. And I do kind of hope it changes people's habits. You know, I changed my own um, to a degree and I learned some surprising information. So I think, um, I hope, I hope others are the same. <laughs> not, yeah. What about you? Do you? Have you like got changes from your sleep? Uh, yeah, I don't use you? one of the wearables, but I've definitely had issues in the past with trying to get to sleep, um, not being able to get back to sleep if I wake up. And I think for me, as with perhaps a lot of people, it's sort of a lot of times tied to maybe, you know, stress or, you know, constantly thinking about things. And I think sort of trying to be more mindful in the day and de-stressing, I think has helped a lot with at least my <laughs> perception of how I <laughs> sleep. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I think uh, I think that information helps you. I mean, I, like I said, I think the hyper-focus on it is um, not super helpful, but I think just getting a general idea of where you are and to can make some broader change. It's funny you said some of the devices you've used give you sort of metrics around mood and things like that. It's funny how much data they have. Have you found those extra piece of information to be accurate or useful? I think uh, the one uh, that's alarmed me the most is stress. Like at the, one of my one of the devices is a. Uh like reading how much stress I have. And I think uh, if that's true, then I probably need to make some lifestyle adjustments. Uh, but I do think for the most part, I it does kind of get a sense of, um, yeah, I, th I think to some degree it might be accurate. Uh, you know, at least the stress piece, like it kind of tells you like over the time of day and I'm like, well, you know, I guess like if I think back on it, that's probably true. So I don't know how they're doing it. And it probably has quite a bit to do with, um, you know, the heart rate and activity potentially uh, that it's picking up. But um, uh, or maybe like how anxious your wrist movements are while you're awake. I don't know. But I think, I think it's fascinating the information that um, these wearables are able to potentially give us. Yeah, I feel like with some of them, with the heart rate measurements, it looks like you've had some intense bout of exercise and you've just instead been sitting in traffic or <laughs> nervous for some meeting. It's so true. I mean, you're like, why is my heart rate 115? <laughs> Um, no, and it's, you know, what I also found is, um, uh, I, I think I was sick and it wasn't a COVID related illness, but it was just like a respiratory illness, but like my heart rate was high for probably a couple days after that. And I was, I was like, you know, am I really dehydrated? What happened? But I think it gives you a sense of maybe your own recovery from illness just in some of these different ways. So I don't know. I feel like, um, and also more and more devices are kind of providing, um, oxygen sensing. Uh, and I mean, I think that's really important for sleep and sleep apnea in the middle of the night. Yeah, that sleep apnea is a good one. That's, God, that's scary. That's like a silent killer, isn't it, that one? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, and especially for men, there's a much higher propensity um, for men to have sleep apnea, at least until women hit menopause. So estrogen, for whatever reason, is fairly protective um, against sleep apnea. So young men who are overweight, uh, what we see in some of the Fitbit and some of this like device data that we get back is younger men who are overweight have horrible sleep patterns. They have short sleep duration, terrible sleep regularity. And 
And what we suspect is these are um, individuals who have untreated or undiagnosed sleep apnea. And yeah, so kind of how we talked about earlier, um, sleep apnea is so important for many of the different um, diseases that people are thinking about, including diabetes, high blood pressure, cardiac disease, including both arrhythmia and coronary artery disease. Yeah, that scared me as well, learning about um, not just overweight, but I know, you know, a few... Uh, guys who've talked about it and they're, you know, fit guys like muscular, but they've got a lot of mass up here. And even that is causing this, the sleep apnea issues. Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, even your jaw architecture, right? I mean, you could right. have a totally normal weight and just how your airways are built may predispose you to having sleep apnea. So yes, it's not only a diagnosis for people who are necessarily unhealthy um, or even or obese or, you know, however you want to categorize it, but many different things can contribute to that. So people you don't expect to have sleep apnea can certainly have it as well. All right. So moving away from the doomsday. <laughs> no, <discussion>. this is terrible. <laughs> when you're not studying sleep, uh, what are some of your other hobbies sort of outside oh, of the uh, um, I play a lot of tennis. I've joined some uh, middle-aged ladies tennis leagues. <laughs> so that's been a lot of fun. I have a seven-year-old. We do a lot of things that he needs to do for school or whatever it might be. I read a lot still, which is a lot of fun. Favorite genres? You know, I have a tendency to really like old um, Russian literature. So okay. I've actually been re revisiting um, uh, Anna Karenina has been the most recent one. And then uh, I kind of, I think I just like some of the classic literature. Uh, and then uh, Persuasion came out on Netflix. I actually went and read that again. Oh, <laughs> I'm a big Jane Austen fan, but oh, cool. uh, I was probably not very exciting for your listeners. Honestly. No, that's fun. I, you know what? I've had a few people tell me uh, what they've been reading. So it's always actually kind of interesting to know outside of just scientific literature, what people's tastes are. Yeah, and I don't know why, but I find like that historical sort of um, stuff to be very relaxing. So I don't know. Maybe it's because it's unrelated to anything else that I could possibly do. You know? Yeah, it's probably a good thing. Yeah, I think so. I think everybody needs some way to sort of like decompress. Okay, well, maybe I'll just end this with my final roundup question I like to throw at all my guests, which is if you could give one piece of uh, advice or your golden wisdom to anyone in the realm of work, career progression, life, health, self-improvement anything, what would it be and why? I think, you know, in some ways I have to say, I think adaptability is so important, right? And I think that applies to like, whether you're in your career, whether it's your life, whether, you know, you've got family issues, whatever it might be. But I feel like our, our ability to adapt is basically what allows us to maybe function on a day-to-day -day basis, right? I mean, if we expect things to be the same or, you know, I mean, uh, you know, if you have, you know, if you're kid has problems or, you know, if your your family has unexpected health problems, right, we've got to be able to change for whatever situation comes for us. And I think, um, you know, I think back to, you know, all the science principles that we learn, right? I mean, I'm, you know, just thinking about how organisms have evolved over time, the ones that have been the most adaptable and able to change, I think, um, tend to do the best. A great answer there, and in an ever-changing world, adaptability is the name of the game. A big thank you to Stuti today for sharing this innovative sleep research, and she's definitely made me consider tracking my own sleep more closely. In the show notes, you can find more information about ongoing sleep studies by the Digital Trial Center, as well as links to the Scripps Research Magazine and other content. Remember to subscribe and hit that five-star rating if you haven't already, and look out for more episodes coming soon. Thank you as always for listening and sleep well.